All right, hi class. So um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to finish up the last uh, bit of the lecture on culture uh, that we left off with today. And so uh, we had just finished talking about different kinds of methods used in cultural psychology, the importance of um, ethnographic, anthropological research and its influence on cultural psych methods. Uh, but then we also address the overall fact that uh, depending on the kind of research question and the area of psychology that we're most interested in, um, cultural psychology methods are actually incredibly diverse and um, there is no true cultural psychology method. Um, it depends on the research question and the study involved. And then we also just talked about uh, weird samples and how they are overrepresented in psychological research. Um, again, with the acronym standing for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic Cultures uh, that are um, disproportionately represented in uh, the samples that make up what we know about psychology. So uh, moving forward, uh, I just want to make sure that we cover uh, two major sets of concepts that are uh, foundational in cultural psychology. First, we'll talk about what are referred to as cultural orientations. And that includes, uh, for example, uh, individualism and collectivism. And uh, the second uh, major concept is one having to do with self-constrols. And um, the examples of different kinds of self-constrols are that of independence and interdependence. Okay, so uh, one overall point I want to make is that um, oftentimes we talk about unpackaging culture. And what that means is that we have to go beyond simply knowing that there are two groups that happen to differ, uh, for example, in some way, on some, type, on some type of variable or on some type of factor, uh, that culture A and culture B are simply different or group A and group B are simply different. Uh, however, uh, when we unpackage culture, we're actually going a little bit deeper. Um, cultural differences are embedded within a vast network of different kinds of cultural practices and beliefs and attitudes and symbols and norms and so on and so forth. So when we unpackage culture, we're actually identifying the underlying variable that creates the cultural differences that we see on the surface. Does that make sense? So the idea is that we're not simply saying that these two cultures are different or these two groups are different. We're actually unpackaging what it means to be culturally different and we're looking at the underlying values or beliefs or practices or norms um, that contribute to that difference. Um, however, uh, when we're examining the underlying cultural variable uh, that um, is uh, underlying uh, the reasons why two groups or cultures might look different on the surface, we also know that we need to be careful about a few things. Um, so essentially we're asking the question, not just what is the difference, but the why is there a difference? What's the underlying variable? But we do have to be careful about, for example, essentializing cultural differences. Uh, so for example, we don't want to be talking um, very broadly in, in stereotypes, right? And so the idea that someone from Japan or South Africa or Germany um, isn't necessarily going to be different simply because they happen to uh, be from that part of the world. Um, essentializing cultural differences contributes to broad sweeping uh, stereotypes and assumptions that we can make. Uh, again, we also don't want to uh, create false dichotomies, you know, and so right now in cultural psychology and in other kind of approaches to understanding the world, we have this east-west dichotomy, um, which is where a lot of that research has focused, but of course we know that that's also a false dichotomy. Uh, there's a lot of within group variability uh, within different cultures as well, and we don't need to think about them as necessarily be di being different from another kind of culture or group on the other end of the spectrum. And we also want to make sure that we're attending uh, not just to the what, um, and again, um, but um, attending not only, not, not just to the what, but also attending to the why. So again, what is underlying these observed differences at the group level? Okay, uh, so moving on, we're talking about unpackaging culture, and that's really what these two major concepts are about. Um, the one about cultural orientation and the concept that's about self-control. So individualism and collectivism, what are they? They are uh, cultural orientations that are reflected in our practices and customs and beliefs and attitudes and kind of all of those other aspects of what culture, culture is. Um, for individualistic cultures, um, that's the term for cultures that have you know, practices and customs that 
emphasize individual goals over collective goals. Um, people here are really prioritizing their own personal needs ahead of uh, needs that are important for their group. And um, there's also a socialization to uh, valuing how unique and distinctive and different you are as an individual. So um, individuals and cultures really value distinctiveness and being special and being different um, as, a, as a benefit, as a positive thing. And there's also a value on self-reliance. So this idea being that you can be independent and, and that's the um, ideal way to live. So um, individualistic cultures really emphasize independent aspects of the self. Uh, collectivistic cultures, on the other hand, uh, refer to cultures where um, individuals are encouraged to uh, place relatively more emphasis on collective goals over individual goals. And so here, the interests and the, uh, the concerns of the group are highly prioritized. And your own personal needs, your own personal wishes and desires are um, subordinated to what the group um, really would want. And so collectivistic cultures uh, tend to emphasize um, interdependent aspects of the self. Um, and accordingly then, in collectivistic cultures, um, people really value their close relationships and their group memberships. Um, it's not important to know how you as an individual stand out uniquely and, and, and uh, how special you are. It's more important uh, that you have strong bonds, that you are able to navigate your social network in an adaptive way, that you know what your roles are, what social expectations are for you, um, what groups you are an accepted member of. Uh, these are the things that are most important about, um, about who you are. Uh, so here's a map uh, drawn from um, a famous um, IBM study conducted in 1984, uh, where Hofstede um, examined the degrees of individualism and collectivism around the world. Um, and of course, I say around the world in a very, very generous way. Um, clearly, you can see on the map, um, all of the grayed out countries are actually countries uh, for which there was no data collected, simply because there was no branch of IBM, uh, the, the company. Uh, there. And so what he did was he examined um, all the countries where IBM had representation and where there were employees who could be asked to complete a questionnaire about their uh, level of individualism. So if you look here at the different colors on the screen with the darker green indicating higher levels of individualism um, and then ranging down all the way to the dark orange uh, where it's very low levels of individualism, you're probably noticing some patterns here. So uh, the dark green countries of the world are all, you guessed it, um, individualistic cultures. They're all Western cultures, right? And so we're talking about uh, US, the US and Canada. Uh, we're talking about um, parts of Western Europe and also some, you know, some parts of Scandinavia. We're talking about Australia. And that's really it. So these are the countries of the world with the highest degrees of individualism. And then if we start looking at the uh, more orange uh, countries in the world, we're talking about roughly collectivistic cultures, right? So we're talking about parts of, uh, you know, there's China and other parts of East Asia, parts of Southeast Asia. We're looking at uh, uh, parts of Africa. We're looking over in South America. We're looking at Mexico um, and, and so on and so forth. So um, we're really talking about more collectivistic cultures. So what does this tell us? When we think about, you know, the weird problem that we talked about before, where Western cultures and Western individuals are actually largely overrepresented in uh, the research that make up the psychology literature, um, and we compare that with, wow, look at the parts of the world where um, individualism isn't the cultural orientation. Um, this tells us something about um, how biased and skewed our results are. Um, so one thing I do want to point out is that there is this same dynamic that um, applies within a given culture as well. So for example, within the United States, um, there are parts of the U.S. that are generally much more individualistic, and then some other aspects that are more collectivistic. And so, you know, just to, just to point out that, um, you know, there's regional differences as well. So we don't want to be essentializing uh, cultural orientations um, for each culture. Certainly there's variability within cultures as well. But when we look at things from a top-down um, country level, uh, this is what we see, uh, the distribution of individualism and collectivism across the world. Um, so again, not meant to be a dichotomy. Um, there's also variability within culture, uh, within countries.
All right, so moving on, uh, here's a quote from uh, Dostoevsky, the great Russian novelist. He says, what man wants is simply independent choice, whatever that independence may cost and wherever it may lead. Uh, so contrast that with uh, what uh, Gandhi uh, said, and he says, interdependence is and ought to be as much the ideal of man as self-sufficiency. Man is a social being. So very wise words describing very different approaches and different priorities um, in different cultures. Um, what do we need? Independence or interdependence? So, um, you know, I want you to think for a second about how you would describe someone who stands out as very different from others. What kinds of words would you use? And some of you, you know, might be thinking about something like unique. Um, some of you might be thinking about something like special or standout. Um, so, you know, thinking about the words that we use, they certainly have certain kinds of, of connotations. If uh, standing out from others is considered to be a good thing, um, a positive where the self is differentiated or made distinct and separate from others, then we might use the word unique. But if standing out is considered a sign of deviance, a sign of being odd and different in a kind of a negative way that cuts you off from the collective, then we might use the word deviance. Similarly, uh, think about what term you would use to describe fitting in. Um, some of you might be thinking about someone who is a conformist. Some of you might be thinking about other words. So similarly, if you adjust yourself to others in order to maintain smooth relationships and you're a cooperative, agreeable person uh, who's able to fit in well, then we might think about it as harmony. But if you're thinking about this as you're molding yourself to be like others because of a fear of being different or there's forced similarity, then we might think about that as conformity. And that has a really different connotation, especially in the West. And that kind of goes back to um, you know, studies on conformity and social psychology, which we'll get to in our next unit. Um, all right, here are some idioms that you might have heard about before, just kind of sayings and proverbs in the culture. For example, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, if you think about what that means, you know, the meaning behind that idiom is that the wheel that makes the most noise actually gets what it needs. It gets the grease that it needs. So if you need something, you need to speak up. You've got to make some noise versus the nail that stands out gets pounded down. And so what that is an example of is this idea that you don't want to stand out in a bad way because then you'll be put back in your place. So again, two very different approaches to what is the best form of the self. And that's really what this is all about. Uh, these quotes by important figures and commonplace cultural sayings are really telling us something important about cultural differences and conceptions of the self. Fundamentally, the question is, who am I? What or who does the self include? Um, what is the self in relationship to others? What is the main goal or the purpose of the self? I mean, these are really the kinds of questions we're asking. And that leads us to the last concept that we want to talk about, which is self-control. Self-control refers to how the self is subjectively construed or organized. How do we view the self? What is the structure of the self? And um, this self-control is incredibly important because it influences a range of psychological processes, and that includes cognition and emotion and motivation. It includes the ways that we think, and that's cognition. It includes the way that we feel, that's emotion. And it also tells us what's most motivating, what are we uh, striving to achieve. Uh, so um, you read uh, the Marcus and Kitayama 2010 paper about self-constrols and how um, they are um, kind of uh, reinforced by society and therefore also society shapes self-constrols. Um, so Marcus and Kitayama are uh, two of the um, just founding people for modern day cultural psychology. Their 1991 paper um, published in a top journal in psychology um, was, is actually one of the most cited papers in psychology period, and it really lays out the notion of an independent and an interdependent self-control. The 2010 paper that you all read is a much shorter um, um, recent update to that 1991 paper, but it's you know very brief and kind of a review overall of what they had written in 1991, and they, they updated a few things. But the 1991 paper is the um, kind of the original, um, really thorough, very extensive uh, review and formulation of theory in this area. So when we talk about independent self-control, 
we're really talking about a model of the self in which identity is thought to come from your inner attributes. It's a focus on inner attributes and qualities that reflect the unique essence of the individual. And the thought is that the self, therefore, remains stable across situations and across the lifespan, right? Because if we're thinking that the self is predominantly uh, defined by your inner qualities, then um, you really shouldn't be changing much, regardless of the context, regardless of stage of life. So a few things I want you to, to notice about this model. There are four things we're going to walk through. First of all, the self here in the middle is distinct from close relationships. There are no overlapping circles. You may touch closely with mother or with brother because they are very close to you. Um, some friends are a little bit farther away. They're not quite as touching to your boundary of self. And then farthest away, we have people like acquaintances and then strangers who are much farther out. So the self is distinct from your close relationships. You're touching, but there's no overlapping circles. Second, the border of the self here is solid. It is a solid line, um, not represented by a dashed line. And what this tells us is that the self is considered self-contained and impermeable. Um, it is unchanging in that regard, and it's not influenced by, um, not easily influenced or changed by others. Uh, the third thing to notice is that inside the self um, contains all big X's. And what this refers to are the especially important aspects of identity that lie within the self. I want you to observe how there are large X's within the individual self. Um, and that's different from the smaller X's that are contained in, for example, mother, brother, friend, and then to a lesser extent, uh, that one acquaintance. So the big X's are especially important aspects of identity and they lie within uh, the self. And that's, um, you're not as um, well-defined. The aspects of who you are, these qualities and attributes are not really, really located in other people. They're primarily within who you are. And last, I want to uh, pull your attention over to the dashed line that separates the in-group from the out-group. And so you'll see acquaintance right here actually straddles that boundary. Um, but otherwise, mother, brother, friend fall in the in-group. And then strangers are really out there in the out-group. And the border between in-group and out-group here is dashed. And so it's permeable. It means that friends and family can drift in and out of your in-group over time. Friends and family can drift in and out of your in-group over situations, depending on what happens. So we have a permeable in-group, out-group boundary, but we have an impermeable self and non-self boundary. And that's really what characterizes the independent self. Um, so moving on, uh, the independence from others um, is really characteristic, again, of the Western world. Um, identity here is largely independent from others, meaning it's self-contained. Your identity is located entirely within the self and driven by self-attributes and qualities. Um, this also means that the self is general and not context-specific. So the self is fairly constant across roles and situations, across a lifespan, again, because it is defined from within, from internal qualities and attributes that are not changed, or at least not easily changed by experiences and by other people. Um, again, the self is derived from inner attributes, so the attitudes and personality traits and preferences and opinions and abilities that you have, uh, these are inner attributes that need to be expressed and asserted, right? These are the things that drive behavior. And there's considerable fluidity um, that exists between in-groups and out-groups. The thing that is stable is the self-not-self -self boundary, but in terms of in-groups and out-groups, that boundary is really an unstable one. Uh, so, of course, you know, we're not saying that um, all relationships are the same to people who have an independent self-control. Um, of course, there are some relationships that are more important and closer than others. But um, overall, the idea is that the autonomy and expression of the self is primary. Now, when we talk about the interdependent self, we're really talking about a different model in which individuals are perceived not as separate and distinct entities, but actually as participants in a larger social unit where their identity is contingent upon the key relationships they, that they have with other people in their in-group. 
And so here, um, if we're looking at the, you know, this diagram again, you'll see that this is actually a strikingly different visual of the self uh, compared to the one that we just saw. And I want to point out four things about this model. So first, the self border here actually overlaps with other relationships. The self is not distinct and completely separate. It overlaps with other close people in your life. Number two, the self border is not an impermeable one, but it's actually represented by a dashed line. And what this tells us then is that the self is actually rather fluid. It is permeable, it is malleable, and it is dynamic. Number three, note that compared to the independent self construal, the interdependent self is characterized by a combination of big X's that lie in the overlap of the individual self with friend and mother and brother and friend. Notice also that mother and brother also overlap with one another. And so here what this tells us is that the key aspects of the self, again, the big X's, lie at the intersection of the individual with the relationship they share with another person. So your experience of who you are really varies according to the situation and the role that you carry in that particular situation. So the individual as a friend may actually behave quite a bit differently than the individual might behave as a sibling to their brother or as the, uh, the child to the mother. So the key aspects of the self lie at the intersection between the self and a relationship. And so it's really found through your situation and it's found through your roles. Uh, the fourth thing I want you to notice is that the in-group, out-group border here is relatively more stable as represented by a solid line compared to the previous model of the independent self-control where that line was actually a dashed and permeable one. So the distinction between in-groups and out-groups is rather unchanging. Uh, therefore, the in-group is actually the stable component of the self. It's not the case that friends move easily in and out of the in-group. And it's not that easy for out-group members, such as strangers, to be uh, considered uh, in-group members. So to summarize, uh, again, we're talking about the interdependent self or the self in relation to others that is characteristic of much of the non-Western world, which is the vast majority of the world. Here, identity is largely interdependent with others. The self is not a bounded whole, but it changes with the relationships you have with other people. Therefore, the self is context specific because it will change and um, adapt uh, depending on the situation that it's in, depending on the role that that person occupies. The self is derived from roles and relationships. It's derived from group memberships and what's expected of you as a member of the group. And uh, the key boundary here uh, that exists is not between the self and the non-self, but actually between the in-group and the out-group. Now, of course, your internal attributes are still there. Um, this theory is not saying that you are a complete robot who only discovers who the self is when you're in the presence of other people. No, that's certainly not the case. But the idea is that your internal opinions and abilities and characteristics are really assigned secondary roles here. Um, they are uh, not as important as your ability to fulfill um, goals and, and, and uh, relationships and to forge strong bonds and to work as part of a collective towards a collective goal. Um, those are considered more primary. Um, and so the very last thing I'll leave you with is that sometimes it's interesting to be talking about these things at a theoretical level um, where it's a little bit more abstract, but sometimes we also need to see that there's actually simply a lot of, you know, uh, underlying physiological data uh, supporting the notion of independence and interdependence acting differently from the brains of folks who live in different cultures. So for example, uh, this really, really cool study by Zhu and Han in 2008 um, examined a sample of Chinese and Westerners uh, who participated in an fMRI study where they were able to look at different parts of the brain that are activated under different circumstances. And so in the sample of Chinese and Westerners, uh, they were asked to use a list of adjectives that were given to them. And the adjectives were a whole bunch of, you know, kind of different kinds of descriptors. And then in one task, they were asked to uh, rate how they scored uh, to evaluate themselves um, on these different adjectives on, on a scale. And then in a separate task, they were asked to do the same thing, to evaluate their mother 
um, according to this list of adjectives. And what did the researchers find? Well, they found that uh, when the Chinese were evaluating themselves or their mothers, the Chinese were showing activation in the same brain regions, regardless of whether they were evaluating themselves or their mothers. Uh, and the same brain regions that are uh, responsible or involved in the processing of self-representations were the ones that were being activated. Specifically, uh, we're talking about the, the medial prefrontal cortex there. However, Westerners are showing activation in different brain regions, depending on the task that they were involved in. Westerners were showing activation in the anterior cingulate cortex uh, for the other task. And so what this tells us is there's actually an underlying difference in how the brain reacts in terms of thinking about the self and mother. Uh, Chinese are representing the mother as a part of the self, and therefore the same brain region is lighting up. Um, however, uh, for Westerners, um, the models of the self and the model of the mother are actually separate. And so we see that there. All right, so that's the end of uh, the, the, the last bit of the culture um, lecture. Uh, feel free to email if you have any questions. Um, and I hope you have a good uh, rest of the week, and I'll see you all next Thursday.